In this lecture, we will be covering pulmonary embolism, hemorrhage, and infarction, pulmonary hypertension, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage syndromes. Blood clots that occlude the large pulmonary arteries are almost always embolic in origin. As it's well known, more than 95% of all pulmonary emboli arise from thrombi within the large deep veins of the legs, most often those that have propagated to involve the popliteal vein and the large veins above it. Risk factors for venous thrombosis includes the following. Prolonged bed rest, especially with immobilization of the legs. Surgery, particularly orthopedic surgery on the knee or hip. Severe trauma, as in burns or multiple fractures. Congestive heart failure. In women, the period around parturition or the use of oral contraceptive pills with high estrogen content. Disseminated cancer. Primary disorders of hypercoagulability like factor V leiden. Two important consequences of pulmonary arterial occlusion. The first is an increase in the pulmonary arterial pressure and vasospasm. The increased pulmonary arterial pressure happens due to the blockage of a flow. Vasospasm is caused by the release of mediators such as thromboxane A2 and serotonin. So if a major vessel is occluded, an abrupt increase in the pulmonary artery pressure will follow and the heart will be pumping against higher resistance, resulting in decreased cardiac output and right-sided heart failure, which is called acute core pulmonale. In some cases, this may result in sudden death. If smaller vessels are occluded, the result is less catastrophic and may be clinically silent. Furthermore, pulmonary arterial occlusion causes ischemia or decreased blood flow to the downstream pulmonary parenchyma. And as you know, the lungs are oxygenated not only by the pulmonary arteries but also by bronchial arteries and directly from air in the alveoli. So ischemic necrosis is uncommon affecting as few as 10% of patients with a thromboemboli. The pathophysiologic consequences of pulmonary thromboembolism depend largely on two factors. First, the size of the embolus, because this factor determines the size of the occluded pulmonary artery. Second, the cardiopulmonary status of the patient, which means the general state of the circulation. So large embolus may embed in the main pulmonary artery, or its major branches, or even at the bifurcation as a subtle embolus while smaller ones become impacted in medium-sized and small-sized pulmonary arteries. This figure shows the gross appearance of a large saddle impulse from the femoral vein lying astride the main left and right pulmonary arteries. The morphologic change of the impulse depends also on its size and general circulatory status. As some large impulse may cause sudden death so no morphologic alternations can be appreciated. Alveolar hemorrhage may be seen with a smaller emboli as a result of ischemic damage to the endothelial cells. With compromised cardiovascular status, as in congestive heart failure, infarction results. So the more peripheral the embolic occlusion, the higher the risk for infarction. And that's explained the fact that three-fourths of all infarcts affect the lower lobes, and more than one-half are multiple. Infarcts are which shape? with their base at the pleural surface and the apex pointing toward the hilus of the lung. Pulmonary infarcts typically are hemorrhagic and appear as raised red-blue areas of coagulative necrosis in the early stages. The adjacent pleural surface often is covered by a fibrinous exudate. The occluded vessel is usually located near the apex of the infarcted area. Red cells begin to lyse within 48 hours. So the infarct gradually become red-brown as hemocidrin is produced. Then fibrous replacement begins at the margins first as a gray-white peripheral zone and eventually converts the infarct into a scar. 
This figure shows the gross appearance of a small roughly wedge-shaped hemorrhagic pulmonary infarct of recent occurrence. This figure shows a thromboembolus in the peripheral pulmonary arterial branch. If there are numerous small peripheral thromboemboli, then the vascular bed is diminished and the pulmonary hypertension may occur. Pulmonary thromboembolisms are mostly clinically silent because they are small, so the bronchial circulation sustains the viability of the affected lung parenchyma, and the embolic mass is rapidly removed by the fibrinolytic activity. In 5% of cases, death, acute right-sided heart failure, or cardiovascular collapse occurs suddenly, as in massive pulmonary embolism. This typically happens when more than 60% of the total pulmonary vasculature is obstructed, either by a large impulse or multiple simultaneous small impulse. In 10 to 15% of cases, pulmonary embolism is associated with obstruction of small to medium sized pulmonary branches. As a result, pulmonary infarction will follow, especially if some element of circulatory insufficiency is present. Those patients usually present with dyspnea. In a small but significant subset of patients accounting for less than 3% of cases, recurrent showers of emboli happens leading to pulmonary hypertension, chronic right-sided heart failure, and in time pulmonary vascular sclerosis, with a progressive worsening of dyspnea. Management includes prophylactic therapy which may include anticoagulation, early ampulation for post-operative patients, application of elastic stocking, intermittent pneumatic calf compression, and isometric leg exercises for bedridden patients. Those who develop pulmonary embolism are given anticoagulation therapy. Candidates for thrombolytic therapy include patients with massive pulmonary embolism who are hemodynamically unstable, as in shock patients. Non-thrombotic pulmonary emboli come in several uncommon but potentially lethal forms, including air, fat, and amniotic fluid embolism. Bone marrow embolism happens due to the presence of hematobiotic and fat elements within the pulmonary artery. This can occur after massive trauma and in patients with bone infarction secondary to sickle cell anemia. IV drug abuse is associated with foreign body embolism in the pulmonary microvasculature. As you may know, the pulmonary circulation normally is one of low resistance, and the pulmonary blood pressures are only about one-eighth of the systemic pressures. So pulmonary hypertension is defined as pressures of 25 mm of mercury or more at rest. This may be caused by decrease in the cross-sectional area of the pulmonary vascular bed or less commonly by increased pulmonary vascular blood flow. Based on the shared features, the World Health Organization has classified pulmonary hypertension into the following five categories. Pulmonary arterial hypertension, which includes heritable forms of the pulmonary hypertension and diseases that cause pulmonary hypertension by affecting small pulmonary muscular arterioles, as in connective tissue diseases, human immunodeficiency virus, and congestive heart failure with left to right shunts. Pulmonary hypertension is due to the left sided heart disease, including systolic and diastolic dysfunction and valvular disease. Pulmonary hypertension due to lung diseases and or hypoxia, including COPD and interstitial lung disease. Chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary hypertension with unclear or multifactorial mechanisms. All forms of pulmonary hypertension are associated with the following three morphologic features. Medial hypertrophy of the pulmonary muscular and elastic arteries, pulmonary arterial atherosclerosis, and right ventricular hypertrophy. Some clues pointing to the etiology may be present. As in the presence of organizing thrombi, this favors recurrent pulmonary emboli as the cause. The presence of diffuse pulmonary fibrosis, 
or severe emphysema and chronic bronchitis points to chronic hypoxia as the initiating event. The visual chains can involve the entire arterial tree, from the main pulmonary arteries down to the arterioles. However, the arterioles and the small arteries are most prominently affected by medial hypertrophy and intimal fibrosis. And in severe cases, atheromatous deposits form in the pulmonary artery and its major branches. This figure shows the histologic appearance of medial hypertrophy affecting an arteriole. Plexiform lesion shows a tuft of capillary formations producing a network or a whip that spans the lumens of a dilated thin-walled small arteries and may extend outside the vessel. This figure shows the histology of the plexiform lesion seen in small arteries. As you see, a tuft of capillary formations spanning the lumen of dilated thin-walled small arteries is present. Diffuse alveolar hemorrhage syndromes happens as a complication of some interstitial lung disorders. Good pasture syndrome, idiopathic pulmonary hemosidrosis, and granulomatosis with polyangitis are considered pulmonary hemorrhage syndromes. Good pasture syndrome is an uncommon autoimmune disease in which the lung and kidney injury are caused by circulating autoantibodies. Those autoantibodies are against certain domains of type 4 collagen, which are intrinsic to the basement membranes of the renal glomeruli and pulmonary alveoli. The antibodies triggers destruction and inflammation of the basement membranes in the pulmonary alveoli and the renal glomeruli, giving rise to the necrotizing hemorrhagic interstitial pneumonitis and the rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. Grossly, the lung shows areas of red-brown consolidation due to the diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Microscopically, focal necrosis of the alveolar walls associated with intra-alveolar hemorrhage, fibrous thickening of the septa, and hypertrophic type 2 pneumocytes are seen. Abundant hemocidrin can be seen due to the earlier episodes of hemorrhage. The alveolar septa show the characteristic linear pattern of immunoglobulin deposition usually IgG, sometimes IgA or IgM, which is the hallmark diagnostic finding in renal biopsy specimens. This figure shows the histologic features of a lung biopsy from a patient diagnosed with diffuse alveolar hemorrhage syndrome. As you see, the yellow arrows points to the large numbers of intra-alveolar hemocidrin-laden macrophages. The black star points to the background of thickened fibrous septa. The tissue in the previous figure has been stained with the prosane blue, which is a special stain used to highlight hemocidrin. An abundant intracellular hemocidrin in this figure is highlighted by the blue color. Most cases occur in patients in their teens or twenties with male predominance. The majority of patients are active smokers. Plasmapheresis removes the offending antibodies, and immunosuppressive drugs inhibit the antibody production. With severe renal disease, renal transplantation is eventually required. Granulomatosis and polyangitis, formerly called Wigner granulomatosis, in this condition more than 80% of patients develop upper respiratory or pulmonary manifestations at some time in their course. The lung lesions are characterized by a combination of necrotizing vasculitis or angitis and a parenchymal necrotizing granulomatous inflammation. So the signs and symptoms stem from the involvement of upper respiratory tract, so the patient may present with a chronic sinusitis, epistaxis, nasal perforation, and the lungs so the patient may present with cough, hemoptysis, and chest pain. PR3 anchor, which is the antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, are present in close to 95% of cases.